there's always a need for donated blood. The blood service says it's on the cusp of a shortage and warns it needs 40,000 new donors to meet demand. There's an urgent need for more blood donors, especially for those of you with the A-positive blood type. Yeah, this is really important. They're almost desperate. The New Zealand Blood Service needs to fill 32,000 appointments over summer. One donation can help save the lives of up to three people. And there are so many people who want to help. Gay men are banned from donating blood unless they've abstained from sex for three months. It's archaic. I mean, it's it's tiring. I'm, I'm getting tired. There are many New Zealanders who can't donate blood because they lived in the UK during the mad cow disease epidemic. Whenever we talk about uh, giving blood, this inevitably comes up and we get a flurry of texts saying, look, I can't give blood and it is not fair. Some of that is set to change. The Blood Service says lifting the mad cow disease restriction on blood donations is safe. We still don't know when that change will come. So if it's safe, why has it taken so long? And is there a chance of change for the many, many gay men who still can't donate? I'm healthy. I'm I'm a married man. Um, Yeah, my blood's good blood. (laughs) Why won't they take it? Kia ora. I'm Tom Kitchen. And today on The Detail, restrictions on donating blood. What's changing and what's not? And is it good enough? First, a new report is out today. Here's the co-author, Associate Professor Peter Saxton, from the University of Auckland School of Population Health. It's very exciting for us. So this is a report on um, blood donation amongst gay, bisexual and other men of sex with men. So it's called SPOTS. What does that mean? It's called SPOTS. That stands for Sex and Prevention of Transmission Study. Uh, It was a study that we launched in 2022. So we've collected the largest ever survey of gay and bisexual men in New Zealand. So over 3,200 took part in this particular report. And they told us really frank things about um, their safe sex behaviours, but also their relationship to blood donation. And what is the big finding from it when it comes to the relationship with blood donations? Well, look, unsurprisingly, many gay and bisexual men are really interested in donating blood. They feel that the current policy is unfair, it's discriminatory um, and, and pretty outdated. What is the current policy? So currently in New Zealand, um, uh, men who have had sex with men in the last three months, and that's oral or anal sex, can't donate blood. So we call that um, deferred from from donating blood. That's a policy that's been in place since 2020. What was it before that? Before that, it was actually 12 months. Uh, That was from 2014. And before that, it was actually five years. And before that, again, 10 years. So quite significant. It really is. I mean, it has evolved over time. And... New Zealand Blood Service, like other countries, um, have improved their policy in um, relation to the latest evidence. Yes. How has that changed over time? Why did it go from, say, 10 years to five years, 12 months, three months? Um, Several reasons. I mean, improvements in technology, so testing technology, improvements in handling blood and processing blood, but also evidence from countries that have uh, liberalised their policies overseas. Obviously, New Zealand's a smaller player, so they look to countries like the UK, um, Australia, Canada, So when they change their policy, if that looks like it's been a safe change for recipients, so it hasn't increased risk, it follows that it would be safe and logical for New Zealand to follow as well. Okay, so why is there that three-month restriction there at the moment? So you have to be abstinent for three months? Yeah, so look, um, all blood in New Zealand is tested. Every single donation is tested. But there's a small but not a zero risk that um, a recently acquired infection of HIV won't be picked up by blood te- blood screening. That's called the window period. We're familiar with that with COVID, of course. So in addition to the testing, uh, all blood services also defer some groups where there's a higher probability of a recently acquired HIV infection. And in New Zealand, of course, um, uh, the one group that's most true for is gay and bisexual men. Mm-hmm. And why are gay and bisexual men more at risk of HIV? So this is historical. It's been true for 40 years. Um, HIV is more prevalent in our communities. It's uh, something that gay and bisexual men have led the world, really, in, in terms of safe sex responses in, in relation to that risk. Um, but it's to do with you know being a small community, um, close sexual networks, the higher risks of, of HIV transmission during anal intercourse compared to vaginal intercourse. So uh, higher risks. 
And that's meant that over the years, it's true that gay and bisexual men are still more at risk of HIV in New Zealand, but also are leaders in safe sex technologies and responses. So that's, I think, why for a lot of gay men, there's a conundrum. Many gay men understand they're more at risk of HIV, but also feel like they have um, higher safe sex practices, maybe than some of their straight counterparts. Many gay men know that condoms work. There's new technologies like PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a pill you can take to prevent HIV. And even for people living with HIV, the new treatments mean that there's zero risk of transmitting HIV to a sexual partner if their virus is suppressed. So for all those reasons, um, you know, many gay men feel that the current policy is unscientific. Right, so that's the current rules as it stands at the moment. So why was it important for you to do this survey? Sure, well, look, um, I mean, first of all, there's a big history here. So, you know, looking back 40 years, they were, those were dark days um, for, for blood donations and HIV. It's been called a new black plague. It's been labelled God's wrath against homosexuals. It's AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and it's here in New Zealand. Before there was an HIV test, um, many people contracted HIV through blood transfusions. Our top story, Ricky Ray's doctors say even they are surprised he is still alive. The 15-year-old has AIDS. He got it through blood transfusions. And often gay men were scapegoated. That's been a tough history. But we've seen a revolution in safe sex practices, particularly in the last decade. So many gay men don't feel at risk of HIV in the same way that they used to. But also, look, the blood service wants to improve its policy. So they, they need blood, but they lack the New Zealand evidence to do so. So that's what our study was designed to answer. What has your study found? You know, if you were going to point out a couple of news angles or a couple of highlights, what would they be? Well, first of all, it's true that most gay and bisexual men can't donate. So under the current policy, um, only 13% or one in eight gay men can donate under the current policy. So who can donate if they've been abstinent for Basically, if they've been abstinent, absolutely. So, you know, that, that'll be true for, for some men. But then we looked at other policies overseas, particularly the UK and Canada. They've got slightly different policies. They changed in 2021 and 2022. They're more liberal. Um, and what we found, if we compared the behavioural responses that our participants gave us with those policies, if we were to adopt at the UK policy, for example, um, 37% of Kiwis who are gay and bisexual could donate. Well, tell me about these two policies. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, so in the UK changed its policy first. That was in 2021. Um, and so they've essentially moved to a gender-neutral policy. They now only ask people if they've had anal intercourse with new or multiple partners in the last three months. It's always been frustrating for me that even though I was in a monogamous relationship, I wasn't able to donate blood when I could see that obviously my blood was safer than some of the donors that may have been a little more promiscuous. Um, so for me today, it's absolutely fantastic that I can donate. Of course, the other exclusions to do with HIV still remain. So that's been, I guess, the leading response internationally. Canada has also adopted a similar policy. All donors will be equally screened for sexual behaviour regardless of their gender or sexual orientation. That to us is a, an inclusive process, a fair process, and one that is rooted in science and evidence. So we're really interested to learn more about what the impact of those policies have been. When we look at the UK, um, there's been a couple of years to look at the evidence and there doesn't seem to be a signal that suggests that liberalising the policy has increased risk to blood donors. That gives us a lot of confidence that we could do the same thing here. But it still stands. These are high stakes. Our epidemic is slightly different than the UK's. We wanted to collect local evidence to inform our own policies. Right, OK. And what is the difference, say, in New Zealand from somewhere like the UK or Canada in terms of our epidemic? So in New Zealand, we have a really concentrated epidemic. So um, gay and bisexual men in New Zealand are about 350 times more likely to acquire HIV than other populations. But we've got an outstanding record too. We've actually got a low-level epidemic. So in the last uh, five years, for example, our new diagnoses have declined more than 50%. That's great news. In the UK, it's a more generalised epidemic. So groups outside the gay community um, also contract HIV compared to New Zealand. Um, and it's also at a higher level than it is in New Zealand. So, again, if we were to adopt the UK policy, we can be pretty confident 
that we would see at least equivalent results here or even um, safer results. What is the exact thing that you are calling for here in New Zealand? Look, I think it's time that New Zealand um, make, made its blood donation policy um, more inclusive. And importantly, we can do that and we can do it safely. So we urge the blood service, and they're a partner in this research, to act swiftly on, on these results. Um, we know that they want to. They are obviously precautionary and want to make sure that, that doing so will be safe. Um, but we certainly looked at the experience of the UK and the US It looks like it's been safe there. And we look at the evidence from New Zealand and we're confident that if we um, made our policy more inclusive, it wouldn't increase risk to recipients. How many new donors do you think this will add to the pool if the changes are made? That's a great question. And so, again, if we compare who can currently donate in New Zealand with some of the UK policy settings or Canadian We estimate that three times as many gay and bisexual men could donate in future if we change to the UK or Canadian models. That's fantastic news. I guess the next question is, um, are people interested in donating and are people willing to donate based on that history? And so again, I think the ball then gets kicked back into the blood services court. They've got a golden opportunity here to rebuild that relationship um, and encourage gay men to come forward and make them feel that doing that will be safe for them. So I think harking back to some of the the responses we got to people who hadn't donated in the past or maybe had turned up but might not have been compliant, they spoke to really understandable issues. They said things like, gosh, there's a lot of social pressure to donate blood. It's seen as a civic um, duty. And so when they went to donate maybe with family or with high school friends, there was this enormous pressure and yet they had to disclose their sexuality. That's actually not a very safe environment for, for some young folk. So they had to come out. Essentially come out. And, and of course, for people um, living with HIV, that will be true. They'll be coming out as HIV positive. So I think there's a, a piece of work here. There are some disincentives to disclose sexuality and HIV status built into the, um, the blood um, donating process that could certainly be improved. Once this report's released, how long do you hope it will take the blood service to make this change? Look, I think as soon as possible. Of course, again, being conservative and precautionary, they'll want to uh, look at other evidence. But um, ultimately, they're not the decision maker. They will make a recommendation to MedSafe because in the context of blood transfusion, blood is a medicine and MedSafe actually oversees that. So the blood service will want to make the strongest case possible They'll hopefully use our our study and overseas research to make that case, and hopefully MedSafe will accept it. Now, something that MedSafe did accept last year. Has the Blood Service relaxed the rules around those who are living in the UK, or what's the story there? Who can donate? So in particular with that one there, which is typically known as the mad cow restriction, um, it is going to be changing um, sometime this year. This is a change the blood service has made, or at least says it will soon. Anyone who spent more than six months in the UK, France or Ireland between 1980 and 1996 hasn't been allowed to donate. The reason is the risk of mad cow disease. Here's Professor Dave Heyman from Massey University. He's written about the disease and our blood supply. Mad cow disease is a colloquial name for a disease in cattle that emerged in Britain uh, really in the 1980s and is a brain disease of cattle that, that caused an epidemic in cows in Britain. It was caused by a new um, disease that was called by, caused by a prion, a new infectious agent. We believe the reason it caused it is because people at the time were feeding uh, infected sheep meat or brain products to cows. Okay, so that's how this all starts. This is where the story starts. But this mad cow disease can be spread to humans, uh, and it's called variant uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Did I say that right? Yeah, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, that's correct. Yep. So what does that mean? Now, we can call it VCJD if we want. So Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease uh, has been described before and um, it's a very uncommon brain disease among people. Andrew Black was a fit 24-year-old working as a radio producer. The diagnosis of VCJD came out of the blue. Within a few months, he changed beyond recognition, the terrible course of this disease destroying his brain day by day. And it causes actually a very unpleasant, 
always fatal degenerative brain disease in people. Actually, about 10 years after the epidemic in, in cattle, there was a, a peak of cases of variant CJD in people that probably came because people were eating infected beef from uh, when there was the epidemic in beef. So there have been restrictions on people who may have been exposed to VCJD when it comes to giving blood, haven't there? Why were there restrictions? Yes, yeah, so, so there were very um, sensible precautionary restrictions put in place, and that is for multiple reasons, but mainly because three people who got blood from um, variant CJD cases got um, CJD, and they themselves got a fatal disease and died. Ooh. Was this around yep. the whole world, this ban? Largely, it depends. I, I don't know that. I don't know every country, um, but certainly many, many countries put in place bans around blood donors, and and it was specifically um, relates to people who have been in the UK because that's where the epidemic was. Yeah. So there were multiple ways that people tried to control this disease. One was to actually ban the export of British beef. I mean, I don't know. If, if people may or may not remember that, but many countries banned the importation of British beef for concerns around BSE and, and basically variant CJD. So that was one of the controls. And in Britain, they stopped feeding sheep to cows and cows to cows, ground up cows to cows and, and various other things. But then the, the blood exclusion, donor exclusion was another way to stop uh, the spread. The CJD, right, the disease, it's fatal. Yeah. Um, yeah. How long do you live with it before you die? Most people are dead within a year, die within a year of a diagnosis. And the incubation period is, is about 10 years, can be much shorter. Um, but the concerns, and this is one of the reasons why it's taken so long for these uh, changes in legislation and around exclusions, is because there's this long incubation period, or there may be a long incubation period for many years. So, But that's where we get into the things about what is the actual risk. Uh, the, the peak of the cases uh, in Britain, so this is Britain, this is with people who were living there eating, um, was about 23 years ago, though, in, in the year 2000. In total, in the whole world, we, we only know of 232 that have been reported. Now, of course, other people could have, uh, have been undiagnosed. And, and three quarters of those were in Britain. But I suppose the other point is right now, there's no person alive on Earth who we, who we know of who has, has variant CJD. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, that's, again, another thing about how well people have mitigated the risk and how yeah, how we don't think is that transmissible. Yeah. So there have been three cases in history that have been caused by blood transfusions. Yeah, there's, there's been three people that died from blood transfusion. So only, only about three of about 60-odd people who received blood from a, from a donor went on to develop disease. Now, I should say each of those cases is a tragedy, mm. but it's it's not a, a, an especially good um, transmission pathway. Yeah, and it's not a, clearly not a majority if it's only three out of the 60. Um, yeah, so, so let's talk about that. What is the risk that this will be spread via blood transfusions? So, well, we think it's very low. I mean, if someone is infected, then, you know, that's just a few percent risk if that someone has it. But actually, because there's no one right now who's alive with the disease, we, we estimated if we took the peak prevalence that we know of, that the chance of, a, of an infection in um, New Zealand from blood donors would be about one in um, one in a billion. Oh, right. Um, yeah, so, we, so we, just, we just don't think there's a reliable risk. We can't say there's none. Yeah. And I think this is why there's uncertainty and why people have taken the precautionary principle. And that's because there's a few characteristics around this infection. Um, one is that you can't diagnose the disease before someone's died. And so you need brain samples, basically. Um, there are some advances in that, but realistically, that you can't screen blood at the minute routinely to say, right, this person it may be a risk. Um, when the restrictions were put in place in New Zealand to restrict uh, people that had lived in Britain for six months or more between 1980 and 1996, New Zealand had about 10% of their active blood donors drop out. So how many people do you reckon this will bring in? Uh, who knows is the honest answer. Um, uh, we, we assume that there might be nearly 10,000 more, um, but, we, but we actually just don't know. You know, that, that won't necessarily fill their gap. But it will go um, a long way to helping. It, it, it'll help, yeah, it'll help, you know. 
Do you feel as a whole that New Zealand is behind the rest of the world when it comes to our blood service and the restrictions around giving blood? I, I think you've, you've put the finger on it. You know, New Zealand has a really proud human rights record in so many areas. And I think it's um, confusing to Kiwis to see us not leading the way with something like blood donation. Um, so I think that's certainly top of mind for lots of people. Um, to be honest, New Zealand has been amongst the most liberal countries historically, but we've often had to wait for those larger countries to move first. But that's it for today. Our guests were Peter Saxton and Dave Heyman. We also requested an interview with the New Zealand Blood Service, but it declined. This episode of The Detail was engineered by Jeremy Ansell. It was produced by Gwen McClure, Alexia Russell and Davina Zimmer. And I'm Tom Kitchen. Thanks to RNZ and NZ On Air. Ka kite anu.